Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, You need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash Insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. This gear has been field tested by some of the best, and they know what it can do, what it can't do. You're going to get reviews, and you're going to have a selection that is bar none right at the top of the list. Having said that, once you get your gift card, all you have to do is go to GoHunt.com and go to the first page and click on Shop and go have some fun. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Hi, folks. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer of Whitetail Rendezvous. And we're heading out to Can- uh, Kentucky, and Kentucky is cold. That's why I'm slurring my words, because it's so darn cold out there. And we're joined by Larry May. Larry's a school teacher, and he's the host and curator of Full Range Outdoors. Larry, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome. Uh, Thank you for having me. Well, it's exciting, and as we were talking in the warm-up, um, you know, you were one of my, I think, uh, first 50 uh, guests way back, way back when. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to get caught up here in, in 2018. I know you've got some announcements to make about what's happening with Full Range Outdoors. And um, why don't we just talk about, start off and tell me how education and teaching kids has, has changed over the year. Basically, that's important because we're going to talk about uh, incorporating youth in the outdoors. So what are the students thinking these days? Well, it, you're right. It has changed uh, a lot over the years. Uh, I've, I've been doing it, doing it for, uh, for uh, I guess, 20 years or so now. And uh, it's changed a lot. Uh, and when I first started, it, it to me, it was a little bit more like when I was in school. Uh, but technology and things have changed so much over the last few years. Um, as I, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking, uh, students uh, in today's world, they live in a, it's an instantaneous world. Uh, everything that they do, they expect instant feedback. Uh, uh, you know, like when we were younger, we've sent letters, uh, we sent emails, and you know, it may take some time for someone to respond back in today's world. They're used to using a computer or a, a, a smartphone, uh, sending a Snapchat, a text, uh, a, you know, a tweet, something like that, and expecting instant feedback. Uh, so that's you know that's something that's changed, and uh, that that leads over into the classroom uh, as far as the way the way you teach. Uh, when I started, it was you know paper and pencil and textbooks. Uh, now today, it's laptops, iPads, uh, smart boards. Uh, a lot of times you don't even have uh, hard copy textbooks. Everything's right on the computer. Uh, you take a test, send it, you know, to the teacher like that. And so there's just so many different things have changed over the years. One thing I know uh, with my grandkids is that they, their parents know if uh, they um, handed in an assignment or not. They, and it's, it's posted. I mean, how's that extra work, you know, for you? Because I'm thinking, okay, you've got, uh, four classes, 20 kids, 30 kids, you know, so you get 100 kids a day and everybody's got assignments instead of sitting there with your book and checking them off. Like in the old days, that's what you did. It just had, you know, you received and not received. Now you got to type it in 
and then respond to the parents. I mean, so the communication maybe is good, but I'm thinking of the workload. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's another aspect. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it, the way things are set up today, uh, you know, in the past, uh, students did their work. They turned it in. You marked it down in a book, and they got a report card every nine weeks or six weeks. Uh, now, uh, whenever I grade an assignment, I put it in the computer, and they get the parents and the students, if, there's, if they have the app on their phone, uh, they get an instant notification when I put the grade in. So parents know within minutes after a student takes a test uh, what they you know what they received on it so that's uh that presents some challenges it you know it's a good thing it's good communication uh parents uh, are up to date on what their students are doing but i try to explain to my students uh you know that if you sit and watch that uh it it can go up and down you may turn in an assignment today that may not be so great and then uh, it, your parents may think you're doing very, you know, very bad, but tomorrow you can make that up, uh, and, you know, the next grade may bring your score up, so, yeah, that presents some challenges like that, you know, communicating and explaining how it all works. Now, can you do all that um, posting, I don't know, lack of a better word, during the school day, or is that nighttime work? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I can do it at any time during the school day, uh, do it at home, I can do it from, uh, you know, from my laptop at home, or do it from uh, at school and uh, or give you another example uh, today uh, here in Kentucky the weather is extremely cold uh, we've had some water issues freezing up so we didn't have school today uh, but we have what's called an NTI day and the students actually do work from home so they so today counts as a school day but they're doing lessons that we have loaded uh, the computer or program they can go to so they do their lessons at home if they have any trouble they can it, it, message me on my computer and I can help them with it and stuff. So what subjects do you teach? Uh, well, currently I teach uh, health and college health. We have a dual credit uh, class at our high school where I'm a, also a professor through uh, a university and the students can take uh, college classes at the high school. So I teach uh, freshman level health and college health. So folks, you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a white shell show. Where's the hunting? And and we're going to get into that part where I'm trying to tie it in for everybody because, one, it's important to know what the heck your kids are doing. Two, it's important to get the kids outdoors. And that's one of the big things Larry strives to do, he and his wife strive to do, is, is get youth outdoors. And so let's talk about, okay, we're out of the classroom now. How do, how do we get Jimmy and Susie and Bob and, and Jane, you know, out into the forest? Maybe they're not hunting, maybe they're fishing, maybe they're just hiking. I, I don't know. And to me, I, I don't really care. Let's get those kids outdoors. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, anything to be outdoors. It, it doesn't matter what they're doing. And that's that's a good question. How do we do that? And, you know, obviously uh, we can have programs at our schools and things to help them do that. But that only goes so far. And there's, you know, limited amount what uh, – teachers or, or someone can do when it comes to someone else's children. But, uh, you know, if we just keep them interested in it, uh, answer questions that they have, uh, explain to them how they can be successful at doing things and stuff, uh, and just, you know, make it make it interesting. Uh, they, they see the things that, that I do or that my wife does. And my son, he's part of our show, and he's actually a junior at the high school I'm at. So they, they see the things that, that we do, and, it, you know, it keeps them interested in it. Uh, and when they come with questions, uh, it, I think it's important that we take our time and not to think that, that we're an adult or that we're somebody special because we have the opportunity to go to Florida and hunt or do something or go to Kansas, um, that we just take the time to, to talk to them and, and answer the questions that they have and things like that. So um, what would five things that you'd recommend to the listeners who have kids or who have neighbor kids that maybe, you know, single parent, you know, what should they do to get those kids uh, engaged in the outer doors? Hmm. Well, um, like I said, one, to get them engaged in the outdoors it would be be available, be available to talk to them, uh, answer questions, uh, if at all possible, if you have the opportunity to take them with you. Uh, 
uh, maybe take them fishing or something. Just take some time out of you, your day uh, to do that. Um, let's see, things to, to get them outdoors. Um, if you have the opportunity to volunteer any time, that, that's, a, that's a big thing. Uh, whether it be volunteering with Little League Baseball or, uh, you know, a local archery club or anything like that. If you can volunteer some time, that's great. Um, and possibly if, if you have any extra equipment that you no longer use, fishing poles, an old bow, uh, you know, at times I've tried to help kids out and maybe give them some scent stuff that they can use. Uh, so if you have any extra equipment to, to pass along. Uh, you know, that's a good thing. And uh, I guess another thing just to get them out outdoors um, would simply be, uh, you know, just make it look interesting. Uh, you know, just, just what the things that we do, uh, make it seem interesting and make it seem fun and successful. Thanks for that. So listeners, you know, um, you might check out your, your state's DNR, uh, Department of Wildlife, whatever it is in your conservation um, you know, uh, organizations because they have kid programs, but you have to go out and, like Larry said, you have to volunteer and uh, and get involved one way or another. And um, you know, that's the best way that I know to do it. Just just get involved with something, and it doesn't really matter what it is. And then you know, start inviting kids and get them exposed because you'd be amazed. You take a kid out here, you know, you take him up to ten thousand feet and the sun comes up or the sun goes down or an elk bugles or they see a, you know, uh, a mule deer or, you know, uh, they might see a cat, you know, or a coyote. It, it doesn't really matter. They just experience something. And it's like, oh, my goodness, this is this is something else because, you know, they're seeing something that, you know, if you didn't take them, they wouldn't see it. I guess that's my message. Yeah, absolutely. Let's stay right with that. You mentioned something, you know, taking kids out and having fun. Why is that so important in, in our world of, you know, of inches make the difference and all, all that for the bone collectors and nothing wrong with collecting bone. But sometimes I think we miss, we miss the hunt because we're working to darn hard to try to get Mr. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I get, I get caught up in that myself. Uh, you know, it, it turns into a, uh, a, a job or something when you're chasing after the, the big rack and you miss out on the, the enjoyment of it. Uh, but yeah, it's important to get them out there. Uh, like you said, the, the inches in their life, uh, it, it can be a matter of inches where a kid goes one way or the other. And, uh, there are so many things out there in this world for them to get involved in. The, the technology that we talked about can be a very bad thing, can be a great thing, but it can be a very bad thing. Uh, and students uh, or kids, you know, they, they spend a lot of time with that technology. And a lot of the, and spend a, t a lot of time around the, the negative things. And so just a matter of an inch or two can change their life, can send them one way or the other. Uh, so yeah, it, it's important, uh, for them to have the chance to see the good things and to get outdoors and experience something that they, that they wouldn't normally get a chance to do. You know, in, in for yourself, you know, how do you make sure you're having fun? I mean, you got a, you got a, uh, production company now full range outdoors and that sometimes i've been told can turn into a job i mean you know it's fun and everybody likes the film but um you know so that one kill shot it, it might be 20 30 hours mm -hmm. oh absolutely <laughs> uh, i have learned that uh real quick over the course of the last couple of years especially getting into filming it uh it can take the joy out of it and uh you, you get caught up in uh chasing uh you know a, a big deer or a turkey and getting it on camera and hunting hours and hours and uh you, know, it, you, you get caught up in it for sure and uh, it can take the joy out of it and I, i've experienced it myself you know get very frustrated and then uh maybe you know i hunt with my dad he's also part of the show and he I, I think I was in one of those points this year. Uh, I'd passed up some deer and, uh, then it was coming back and, uh, the ones I was after wasn't coming around. I was uh, getting a little bit frustrated. I think you could tell that. And so, you know, he gave me some words of wisdom or my wife will mention something or then you see that sun come up and then 
you think, you know what, you just get just chill out, relax a little bit, and enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, and it's um, to me, it's those little moments um, that make up the hunt. And you know, because I'm like everybody else in the world, I don't get something, I don't kill something, I don't harvest something every time I go out. Um, doesn't happen. But you know, every single hunt I go out, I, I've got something to take away from that hunt. Was it, you know, was it an owl hooting, you know, or was it a turkey gobbling, or you yeah. know, was it a pack of coyotes just raising ruckus? You know, mm-hmm. all those little things are. You know, it's meaningful, you know, to me. And that's one thing I would shout out to, to everybody listening to this, you know, find the joy in the hunt and, you know, and sure, we all want to kill kill that buck or, you know, or whatever we're after. But, you know, there's so much to to enjoy in a hunt. Uh, just your best buddy, your, your wife, your kids. I mean, it goes on and on and on. You know, some of the best times I've had uh, with my son is in a goose pit, you know, mm-hmm. and the sun comes up and you're just sitting there all day. So you get a lot, a lot of time between naps, between naps to kind of chit chat and, and, and find out what the heck's going on. But th- those are the, those are the great times to me. And the older I get, the more important they are. Your thoughts. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, like you said, it's just, uh, seeing the sun come up or, uh, the other, the other day I was hunting and there was some turkeys uh, starting to gobble and stuff, which is, you know, you don't hear as much in the uh, winter time. Uh, but yeah, enjoying those little moments. And that that's to me, uh, of course, you want to uh, harvest an animal and you want to get it on film. But I really enjoy the, that, those things and having the opportunity to hunt with my dad and my wife, and my son. Sometimes the best part of our hunt, you know, is me and my son coming back and just getting lunch on the way home. Uh, and just spending time together and stuff like that. So, yeah, that that I'm I couldn't agree more with you. That's the same things that I enjoy out of. Before. Let's let's start unpacking uh, full range outdoors. Uh, Why did you set it up and where are you going with it? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we set it up about three years ago. Uh, I just wanted to be involved in the outdoor industry, uh, do something uh, most you know primarily with hunting. It's but I we do fishing and other things and. Uh, I just wanted to get involved. I wanted to do something, uh, do some writing or maybe some pictures and uh, filming. And uh, so we got started with it. And as as we moved on, well, we started filming more. And, you know, people started uh, liking what they seen or would talk to us about it. So it just, you know, just kind of snowballed from there. And so it, we got, to, got the opportunity to work with a lot of great companies and, uh, I really enjoyed the filming part. I do most of the time I'm self-filming, especially when it comes to whitetail hunting. And uh, I found that I really enjoyed it. And it, in a way that it kind of calmed me, uh, you know, you get the, the nerves that come up when the deer starts to come. But I found when I was working my camera and doing things like that, I was keeping myself kind of occupied and uh, a little less nervous uh, when it comes to that part. Um but it just, you know, one thing led to another, and we started a YouTube channel and uh, started putting videos on there, and videos on Facebook, and and we had the opportunity to talk with the Hunt Channel, and uh, they liked the work that we that we've been doing. So it just said one thing led to another. So uh, we're getting things lined out to uh, start going on their networks here in 2018. Now, when you go on the Hunt Channel, do you have to pay them, or is it just you know, there's no money changing hands. How, how does that work for the people out there going, you know, I'd like to have, you know, I'd like to be on the hunt channel. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, there's so much involved and I'm still learning that, uh, everything about that. But yes, you, uh, when it comes to your show airing on the hunt channel or, other, or most other networks, uh, you pay for airtime and you have time slots. Air times may vary depending on uh, what platform you're doing or uh, whether you're in prime time or, uh, you know, uh, on one of the lesser peak times and stuff. So you pay for airtime and uh, then you have a slot, usually uh, first, second, third, fourth quarter. And then you have so many shows that you can produce and put on there. Uh, so then it's kind of up to you to, you know, you, like I said, you pay the airtime, then it's up to you to, to sell commercial slots or have sponsorship dollars and things to cover those costs. So um, 
I'll just ask you so you don't have to answer. So a uh, type of show, 30 minutes, um, video, um, not prime time. What's that going to run a guy or gal? Mm, that's typically. The, yeah, typically, I want to say the, I'm trying to think now exactly, Bruce, um, about $75. Now, this is just kind of ballparking it right now. About $75 a week, uh, at least different networks will be different prices, but about 75 to maybe a hundred dollars a week, uh, for about 13 weeks. Okay. So 1300 bucks. Yeah. And we're not talking about the pursuit channel or sportsman channel, you know, um, we're talking, you know, a, a, a lower tier, if you will, mm-hmm. you know, um, but it's still an outlet and your work's being put out there. Yep. Exactly. So can't you do the same thing with the Instagram or a Facebook account? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, Yes, you could. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we've been doing it with, uh, like I said, on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. So it's, uh, close to the same stuff with the, when we decided to go with the hunt channel, we kind of turned ours into more of a business and, uh, you know, looking to, uh, work with, uh, sponsor dollars and commercial time and stuff. But with the hunt channel, we found, We've got access to be on uh, th- their different networks, which will be on you. So you can get the show on Roku, uh, Apple TV, um, and Amazon Fire, uh, and watch it live or, or on the video on demand on their website. And then, of course, they have a dish channel as well. Now, did you look at um, Gen 7? I think it's Gen 7 Outdoors. Uh, no, I, I'm, I've heard of them and stuff, but I haven't really looked. Uh, at their stuff yet okay it's a town simpler mm-hmm. you know i know a couple of years ago i had um i forget his name so i better be quiet but anyway you know so they were out there too as as there are you know probably hundreds of people that are outlets you know uh, aggregators and then they're you know production and then uh you're out there but you know that i think that's fun i mean you know you and your wife your son your dad you know it's a family affair and, and you're putting some stuff together and and uh, for those out there, what kind of you're self-filming, what kind of gear are you using? Uh, well, with the gear that I use, uh, I use a Canon uh, uh, sitting right here. I've been working on stuff all day. Uh, most of my filmings with the Canon uh, R700, and it's, it's your basic uh, video camera. Uh, and, of course, I use external mics and things with it. Um, my second angle cameras, uh, I work with, uh, Ultra Pro X cameras, uh, so I use that, them, uh, muddy camera arms, uh, then your basic tripods and things, so, uh, I guess that's most of the gear that I use, and then, uh, edit my own stuff and produce my own stuff at, at home. So you're doing all your own editing? Yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, okay, I, mean, I was going to ask, now, so... You're self-filming, so you don't need double sets. But then how do you get all the arms and all the gear up there, plus your bow, plus your, you know, thermos for, you know, for food or sandwich or something like that? How, do, how does all that work out without spooking yeah. every single deer in the forest? Yeah, that's a good question. What I Now, here's what I do. Uh, other than having a very heavy pack, uh, we have, with most of my, unless I go somewhere else to whitetail hunt, uh, the way I have it set up is we have a lease, and on all of the sets that I have, all the stands that I have, I have some type of camera arm that I leave there. And whether it be uh, one of my muddy arms or something, and so in a lot of them, I have a camera arm already set up there, so all I have to do is carry the camera in. And then if I'm hunting a blind or something, I just take the tripod, tripod in with me. Uh, so, and then I have extra attachments that I figured out a way to hook up and stuff to, to mount to the sides of the stands and things. So that's how I set it up, uh, on my property that I, that I spend most of my time hunting. And then if I go somewhere else, uh, I've got a smaller camera arm that I take and just plug it all in with me. So, so are you using, um, uh, sticks to get up then, you know, um, and hang on stands? Uh, most of everything that we use are ladder stands. Okay, ladder stands. Yeah. So they're kind of hard to run and gun with. You know, I know some guys that, you know, use use the uh, hang-on stands, and, and they film that way, but it's just like they get everything down to, 
you know, they're minimalist, you know, in, in the pure sense, but they'll, they'll go in, set up, get the camera up, get the bow up, get all set to shoot. And, uh, you know, it's not even light yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's another thing is that it, you have to get in early. Uh, it, you know, to set all that stuff up, uh, you're, I always like to be in an hour before daylight anyway, just to hunt, but you're, you've got to get in uh, well before daylight just to get everything uh, hooked up and then sit down and let it all settle back down. Now, so you're in your tree stand. Do you use um, uh, headlamp filters like a red or a green? Any filters or are you just using white light? Just white light. Yeah. Doesn't like seem to bother the deer? No. Uh, that, in my experience, it hasn't. I'm learning all the time, so you know, I'm always willing to change, but I've, it's the way I've run it so far. Yeah. Now, okay. So, do you take any B-roll before or after you, um, the harvest or the kill shot? Uh, mostly after. Uh, so occasionally before, but mostly after. So, if that that squirrel's just right above your head, you wouldn't take a shot at him before you killed your deer. Uh, well, I, I I do on occasion, but but most of the time after. Okay, so why? Well, why is that? So, you're sitting there, the sun's coming up, and you know. There's plenty of, you know, B-roll opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, like I said, it all depends. Uh, it, and sometimes I do uh, shoot some things before. But, uh, you know, I'm just always trying to make sure that I don't spook anything, uh, you know, while I'm sitting there. So kind of kind of all just depends on the situation. Well, it's interesting. Um, and folks, you know, reach out to Larry on, um, on uh, Facebook or, you know, uh, get hold of him one way or another because he's a teacher at heart so he's more than willing to share with you uh some of his secrets uh that'll help you get started if, if you want to go down the road of being uh a videographer absolutely absolutely anything like i said i i'm never uh, think of myself as a professional or someone that knows everything but anything that i've learned uh i've been more than happy to pass on hey great segue passing on the hunting tradition you know, we talked about that, that we wanted to explore that a little bit. And let's go back to where yours began and how you're passing that hunting tradition on to family and friends and and people that you don't even know. Uh, yeah, uh, my hunting uh, tradition, it began back uh, as, as early as I can remember, uh, just as a little boy, uh, probably five or six years old, uh, going hunting with my dad. Uh, just I can remember just tagging along. You know, he would squirrel hunt or uh, do something like that, and I would just uh, be there with him, just walking and looking and stuff. And as I got a little older, spending time with my uncles, my dad, and his two brothers, uh, we did a lot of rabbit hunting and uh, squirrel hunting, things like that. Uh, got into deer hunting later in life, uh, but just, you know, grew up with them and uh, learned all about the outdoors from them. And, you know, and what it means to be outdoors and respect the outdoors and uh, everything that it can bring to us and stuff. So my, those traditions started with me just from the earliest of ages. And as I've got older, uh, just wanted to pass them on to my son, uh, you know, my daughters as well. They're they're not hunters, but uh, just the importance of being outside. And I'll, you know, I've taken when they were smaller, taking them fishing and things like that. And now having the opportunity uh, to hunt with my son and teach him the the things that my dad taught me or that my uncles, you know, taught me. And uh, right now getting to hunt with, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, which is pretty often my dad and my son at the same time. Just getting to watch my dad teach him the same things that he taught me. You know, so That's great. And, you know, uh, have one, have your dad still around. And, you know, What's one or two things that uh, he taught you early on that you're carrying it forward today? Things that he taught me earlier was just a couple. Yeah, it, you know, not even so much saying it is just his actions, uh, respecting the land, uh, and not, you know, don't tear things up, don't cut something down just to be cutting it down. Don't don't leave your trash. You know, uh, just his actions. Uh, he, you know, he's he's a quiet person. I guess it's more or less his actions that did things, just uh, learning from example from him 
you know, things like that. Just re- respect what you're doing, respect the land, uh, leave it better than the way you found it. So how do you think Full Range Outdoors helping, um, you know, passing on the hunting tradition? Well, I, you know, I, I've seen things that I didn't realize that, that we would be doing uh, as far as that. And, and the hunting tradition and stuff is that people coming and just talking about it, whether it be an adult or, or a young kid, and just engaging and being so excited about seeing the things that we're doing. And and some of them, like I said, maybe not have the opportunity because we've been blessed to, to hunt different states, you know, go to South Carolina or Florida or Kansas uh, and tur- do everything from turkey hunting to gator hunting. And uh, people, you know, they see that and I, I run into them on the street and I, I had no idea that they would feel that way about it. And, you know, they just say, talk about, uh, you know, how great it was to see us doing that and communicate on Facebook and stuff and leave messages uh, and just gets them excited uh, about going out and hunting. And like I said, some of the kids where I teach at, see in the community, uh, they want to know about, oh, you use that, uh, you know, Denver's deer scent to to make that scrape with. How can I do that? And, you know, how do you do this or how do you do that? So it's just giving me an opportunity to teach people things about the outdoors that, uh, you know, I never realized I'd be able to do. That's great and good promo, uh, Denver uh, Deer Scent. Um, so this is the point in the show. We'll take a couple minutes and talk about gear and the last piece of gear that you bought. Um, I had one guy say, well, I just picked myself up a, a new F-150. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good four by four. That's a heck of a piece of that yeah. gear. You bought. But, um, you know, coming back to Earth, Bruce, you know, what was the last piece of uh, gear that you bought and uh, why'd you buy it? Uh, let's see. Uh, one piece of gear, uh, is, uh, my ozone, uh, bag from scent crusher. Uh, of course I, I work with them and, and picked it up there, but, uh, that's a piece of gear that I found that's been extremely valuable. Uh, in my opinion this year, I have, uh, using that product, the, uh, ozone gear bag, uh, this past deer season and their ozone go, uh, that you plug into your cigarette lighter and your, truck when you're going hunting uh, I have found uh, is great for eliminating odor and uh, I honestly uh, can say that I cannot remember a time all season uh, that I you know had an issue with a deer winding me and scaring them off and stuff like that so that gear bag has been a valuable piece of equipment for me this year. Now how many set or suits can you get in there um, in, in the gear bag? Uh, well, it depends, uh, you know, early season or late season, um, but um, you can put several suits in there. I usually, I don't like to fill it too full and make sure everything gets circulated, uh, but you can put your base layer, outer layer, as long as you're not talking about your extreme uh, heavy coat and stuff, you can put, uh, you know, your base layer and your uh, top layer and a uh, hat and everything in there and then just zip it up and you can. Uh, turn it on for anywhere from five to 30 minutes uh, to, you know, and then the ozone works and eliminates the odor. Since you're a teacher now, okay, uh, and some people already know how ozone works, but why don't you just take us through it? You know, why, you know, you got Ozonics and you got, of course, Scent Crusher, uh, some great companies out there that are using ozone technology to, you know, blow our scent away or, you know, eliminate the scent. Uh, so, how does ozone work? Well, I wish I could tell you exactly how it works, but uh, I just I, I do know that it it filters through, and uh, my understanding is it removes the odors. And the deer they do not uh, have an issue with smelling it because when you use the product, and some people uh, they'll use it and they say, "Well, I can smell my clothes. Well, can't the deer smell that?" Because it does it has a distinctive odor to it. But what it does is it's it's putting the ozone in there and then that's a something that a deer doesn't doesn't smell or doesn't recognize as being an, an issue so uh like i said i don't know the ins and outs exactly uh but it, you know it's it's something that it doesn't bother the deer at all so the ozone goes in there and, and and jumps on the molecules you know sweat molecules or dirt or whatever or does it just change everything over and replaces that smell with the ozone smell yeah i 
if I'm not telling you wrong, it it replaces it with the ozone, ozone smell. So rather than a, a charcoal filter where it filters it out and, you know, the input is all that sweat, out of it comes, you know, there's no sweat. It, there's, there's basically nothing. And, you know, carbon fiber, I mean, you know, companies have made gazillions of dollars of scent locks, scent blockers, uh, all of them with the carbon. And I have some of that stuff. And some days it works and other days, <laughs> yeah. other days it doesn't. Yeah, there's nothing that's 100%. Uh, it, it's kind of funny. I think, you know, I didn't have too many sits last fall because of, you know, uh, my um, happenstance. But I remember one morning I was in the right place. And I knew I was in the right place. And all of a sudden I hear this deer coming off the hill. And he was going clunk, clunk, clunk. And then he jerked up. And I went, sugar beets. And uh, because he smelt me, you know. And, you know, it, he just smelled me, couldn't see me because I was on the other side of the knob. So, but the wind had carried right to him. Had he not done that, I mean, it could have been a 20 yard shot uh, easily, you know, because I was right, you know, I was right exactly where it needed to be. And I'm just wondering, okay, if I had uh, Ozonics or, or Scent Crusher or any of that, could he, you know, could he slip, you know, slipped in on me? I'll, I'll never know. You know, but that's interesting. So, folks, if you've got some uh, input on, on that question, uh, utilization of ozone, um, send me an email at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. And I'd like to hear what, what you have to say because, um, you know, I've heard a lot about it, talked to people about it, and, um, you know, they've done a great job with their pro staffs. I mean, you know, uh, the companies that we've been talking about do an excellent job, you know, supporting the people and getting the product out into the field. So with that, we're going to, we're going to move right along and talk about uh, 2017 deer hunts, how that went. And we know you did some filming, but you know, did you, did you put a bucket or a doe on the ground? Did you get meat in the freezer or what happened? Uh, yeah. Well, this has been one, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most successful deer seasons that I've had. And I, I did, I only harvested a doe. Uh, I passed on multiple bucks this year. And I, but I say it's been one of the most successful is because uh, here in Kentucky, I've got four tags and I could have filled those tags at least three times over. Uh, just about all the encounters with deer that I had. And, uh, just, you know, kind of going back to enjoying the sun coming up and all that stuff. Uh, that's what's made it so successful to me that I had all those encounters uh, with deer uh, at close range. Most all of that was, uh, with, you know, I could have shot them with the bow. And so I took uh, a doe in at early October and was blessed to get that all on film and stuff. So that'll be in an episode uh, this year. And uh, then after that, um, you know, I had the opportunity multiple times to shoot more doe and bucks uh, i had several bucks this we, we were hunting a new property that we picked up last year and it was our first year on the property and after i got you know the information in and stuff I had some really nice bucks so i was just in pursuit of those and uh, passed up a lot of smaller bucks along the way so uh, so like i said took took one doe uh, but had the opportunity to take a lot of other deer so one thing i know uh wait till uh Kevin, uh, Tevis McCauley, uh, you know, they shoot some big bucks and there's some big bucks being taken, you know, in Kentucky. Why do you think that is? Well, I, it, I was just talking about that with someone the other day that when you read a lot of things, Kentucky seems to be uh, in the top five every year in big bucks. And I think it's a, a two different things. Uh, one is the state, you have the eastern part of the state, which I'm in. And uh, we have a lot of a lot of mountains and a lot of things like that. So the deer can get lost in those mountains. They're a little bit harder to find. Um, you don't have as a far a shot, but there's a lot of oak trees, a lot of white oaks and red oaks. And there's a so there's a lot of things in there for them to get good nutrition and, and to grow big and to stay hidden in the thickets and stuff. So uh, there's some really big deer come out of this part of the state. And then you've got the western part of the state, which you have the farmland, which resembles a lot of your Ohio and Kansas and that type of thing. So you've got deer that are getting big on, 
uh, corn and beans and things like that in the western part. So I think it's you know it kind of goes two different ways. You got the farm deer and then you got the mountain deer that are growing. So either way, you get some pretty big deer. Yeah, and you know it used, Kentucky used to be a sleeper state, not so much anymore. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just you know, it, and we're talking we're talking large deer, but we're talking to, about a good quantity deer. Like uh, Buffalo County, I've been hunting that for a long time, and yeah, you know, there's there's 200 inch deer there, but um, the numbers that get fewer and fewer. Uh, one of my buddies who who outfits or guides or or makes possible for people to go hunting, um, you know, they they took a bunch of deer, but um, you know, 150 ish, you know, was their top end. I think they had one above that, but uh, you know, everything was Pope and Young to that 150 block. And, um, you know, so are they great deer? Yeah, they're, they're tremendous deer and, 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 you know, but Buffalo County has a pretty good reputation of pushing out some, you know, very large, you know, large deer and things seem to be changing. And again, folks, if you get some input on that, uh, get a hold of me at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. Like to hear, like to hear your questions or your thoughts on, on that. You know, you, you think about, the whitetail industry, which you're part of, I'm part of, and, uh, you know, it's really fun. I get to talk to guys and gals all over North America. You know, that's, that's the fun. Yeah, that's the fun I get. And every once, you know, not every once, but every, every show I'll pick up something, you know, something new, you know, uh, for my guests. That's for sure. Um, I think we're good. What do you think? Uh, yeah, it's been, been great. We covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. So having said that, this is Bruce Hutchinson, the host and executive producer of Whitetail Rondo, thanking Larry May, Full Range Outdoors, for being a guest. And I can't wait till when we catch up to him next year. And uh, and it's fun to go back around and, and have guests that I had early on and then, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then see what they're doing and they can see what I'm doing. So uh, yeah. I just thank you so much. And, uh, you know, uh, take care of that good wife of yours because I know she's, she's mm-hmm. got have patience of a saint i absolutely can't ask for one better on the next episode we're going to head down to tennessee and connect with stacy walker who is stacy walker well she's the ceo of prime one camel and she does more than that Um, i'm excited for all you guys and gals to hear her because she's going to tell you what it takes to build a brand what it takes to break into the outdoor industry Uh, she's expanded her business uh, to include fishing to include licensing on all sorts of things. You want your truck wrap with prime one? Well, that can happen. So sit back, relax, take notes and listen to Stacy Walker. Tell about her story and journey with prime one. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.